So, good morning. And as uh, Henri said, uh, imagine that I'm Jonathan Evans. <laughs> I tried to find a, a kind of mask uh, identified to his person, but I, they, they don't sell them in Montreal, so I'm sorry. <laughs> well, uh, Jonathan Evans could not be here, and he's, uh, he would really like to be with us, so he has sent me a paper that he wants me to read, and a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, Jonathan Evans, as most of you know, has been very important in the history of dual processes. Uh, he has been, all his career, one of the leaders in that field. And uh, this, after discussing with him, he agreed to present a kind of big picture of the history of uh, dual processes and of the state of the heart in that field uh, right now. Okay, so uh, the, the theme is from dual processes to two minds. The distinction between two kinds of thinking, one fast and intuitive and the other slow and reflective, has a long history in philosophy and psychology. So this goes along with what uh, Ari explained in the introduction. It seems to have been invented many times in the psychological literature with authors often writing in ignorance of the similar concepts proposed by others. The distinction between unconscious and conscious thinking, popularized by, but not invented by Freud, has been called upon quite fre frequently in modern social psychology. By contrast, cognitive psychologists mostly avoid reference to consciousness, preferring instead to name such dichotomies as automatic control, implicit explicit, <clears throat> and intuitive reflective. But a basic idea is pretty much the same in all these cases. We may make our decisions in fast intuitive ways without being conscious of how we did it, or we may reason slowly and reflectively with at least the feeling that we are consciously aware of what we are doing in contemporary cognitive theory, the proposal is often that we use a combination of these two kinds of thinking which can interact in different ways. Within, within cognitive psychology, dual process theories have figured in theories of vision, attention, learning, and memory but I will focus here mostly on their application to the psychology of thinking, reasoning, and decision-making. In these fields, we can see historical origins in the pre-war work of the Gestalt psychologists. Inside problem solving, for example, comes with a sudden rush into consciousness, implying some pre-conscious, perception-like process that preceded it. In this period, there were studies of incubation, the proposal that problems might be solved by unconscious processes, whilst conscious attention was directed elsewhere. The identification of set and functional fixity as processes which blocked insight are also relevant as contemporary authors have proposed that cognitive biases can arise because attention is directed to the wrong aspects of the problem features. My own heuristic analytic theory of reasoning, a dual processing account, emphasizes such cases of misdirections in cognitive bias. Defining dualities. Moving from these general notions of dualities to something better specified as a testable scientific theory has proved a challenge. There has been much scope for confusion of terms and concepts, so I will start by making some distinctions among dualities themselves. Okay, here are some of the dualities concerned here. 
In particular, I want to distinguish types, modes, systems, and minds. The fundamental distinction of cognitive dual process theories is that there are two distinct types of processes. The earliest such theory of reasoning was published in 1975 and distinguished between type 1 processes that were fast and unconscious and type 2 processes that were slow and conscious. So the first version of the theory. The terminology did not stick at the time and was superseded by the terms System 1 and System 2, later introduced by Keith Stanovich and popularized by Daniel Kahneman. However, both Stanovich and myself have in recent years recommended revision to the Type 1 and Type 2 terminology for reasons that I will explain. Cognitive types, to my mind, do imply some kind of distinction in terms of underlying cognitive and neural systems. However, it does not follow that all type 1 processes belong to a singular system 1 and that type 2 processes to a particular system 2, which is where the problem began to arise. Type 2 processing is easier to define as we can equate it with a central working memory of the type proposed by Alan Badley, or with what is also known as controlled attention. This is by its nature a singular system. However, type 1 processing, as Stanovich has also observed, is a ragbag. All that defines type 1 processing is autonomy, but autonomous processes occur in a number of different ways. Some are innately hardwired, like much of the visual and language systems, which make important inputs to human thinking. Skills and habits acquired by learning also operate in an aut autonomous manner so that we can, for example, plan a lecture while driving to work. Some processes require type two processing initially, but become automated into type one processes later and so on. There simply is no singular system one to which they could belong. Okay, a workable definition for the time being is that type two thinking engages working memory, whereas type one processing does not. However, it is all too easy to confuse the proposal of two types of thinking with what I now call two modes of thinking. Modes are not cognitively distinct types, but rather different styles of thinking reflecting the individual's personality, experience, culture, or current instructional, instructional set. <clears throat> For example, it is known <clears throat> that Westerners have a more analytic and less holistic cognitive style than East Asians. These styles are mutable. For example, Easterners think more like Westerners after a prolonged period living in the West. Such differences do not reflect dual processing. They cannot be distinct types in the sense defined above. There are also a number of measures of rational thinking dispositions known to affect performance, on thinking and decision-making tasks, such as the need for cognition scale and the rational experiential inventory. These scales measure a continuum of processing styles, showing again that modes of thinking are not the same as types, which must be discrete. discrete. <clears throat> types and mode have a close relationship, however. To illustrate this, Consider the now famous bat and ball problem used as part of the cognitive reflection test. Okay, a bat and a ball together cost $1.10. If the bat co costs uh, $1 more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? The correct answer is five cents, and the common intuitive error is 10 cents. This goes in the same direction uh, as what uh, only uh, explained with the belief bias. Okay, so uh, 
working out the correct answer, five cents, involves some very, some very simple algebra, well within the capabilities of the Ivy League students to whom this task was originally administered. And yet, many gave the intuitive but wrong 10 cents answer. Very interesting. How could this happen? The correct answer requires type two processing. That is some explicit reasoning, however simple. The participants are easily capable of this reasoning. So the only explanation is that they accept the intuitive answer that comes to mind without making any effort to reason. So a rational disposition is a willingness to apply type two reasoning and the opposite is a reliance on unchecked intuition, which can lead us astray. The extent to which a person has such a disposition is partly a function of personality, but can also be influenced by culture and by experimental instructions. Keith Stanovich has placed great emphasis on the distinction between general intelligence or IQ on the one hand and rational thinking disposition on the other. The first me measures the, the capacity for type two reasoning and the second, the inclination to make use of it. What this means is that smart people can make dumb decisions. If they rely on intuition, they would, they would do so. It should be added that there are also those who argue that reliance on intuition can sometimes lead to better decision making. The two positions are not contradictory for a dual process theorist. Where relevant experiential learning has taken place, type one processing can lead to rapid and effective decision making. Studies which place blame for a error on intuition are predominantly those whose authors present participant with novel problems, which can only be solved by explicit reasoning. In practice, most forms of expert thinking require a mixture of the two types of thinking, depending on the degree of novelty of the current problem. The terms system one and system two were originally introduced by Keith Stanovich in an attempt to classify a number of different dual process theories with broadly similar characteristics. It was never intended to represent a singular, well-defined theory, although many readers took it as such. Keith and I are agreed that this terminology is now best avoided. While Kahneman uses these terms in his popular book on the subject, referring to thinking fast and slow, of course. He does so more or less simultaneously with our use of type one and type two processing. It should be noted, however, that some dual system theories were precursors to what I now term two minds theory. In this approach, we distinguish between an evolutionary whole and animal-like mind and an evolutionary recent and distinctively human mind that coexists in the human brain. And I would say, it's, according to him, is the foundation of dual processes. Clearly, each mind calls upon multiple cognitive and neural systems, another reason for abandoning the system one and system two terminology. A dual processing example believed by us. Much dual process research has focused on prior knowledge and belief as a source of type one processing, which may compete with type two reasoning. Some authors even use the terms logical reasoning and belief-based reasoning as synonymous with type one and type two processing, although this is not accurate on either count as I show later. However, I will briefly discuss the belief bias effect in syllogistic reasoning as a paradigm which has inspired much dual process theorizing. Syllogistic reasoning is quite complex. People have to relate three, three terms in two premises and to decide whether a conclusion logically follows. It will remind some exercises and courses of logic to our students. Typically, 
Syllogisms take around 30 seconds to solve and performance is related to intelligence and working memory capacity. With abstract syllogisms using arbitrary terms like A, B, and C, people frequently endorse fallacies. That is, they often say that a conclusion must follow logically when it is only possibly true given the premises. When realistic terms are used, people are considerably influenced by their beliefs in the conclusion given. Okay, are these arguments valid? Do the conclusion necessarily follows? No addictive things are inexpensive. Some cigarettes are inexpensive. Therefore, some addictive things are not cigarettes. 71% of the people say yes. No millionaires are hard workers. Some rich people are hard workers. Therefore, some billionaires are not rich people. And the yes goes down to 10. But the structure of the inference is exactly the same. Exactly as uh, uh, Henri showed in another example. Okay, now, when realistic terms are used, people are considerably influenced by their, their beliefs in the, given, in the conclusion given, compared to two slides, the, the two syllogisms that I have presented on this slide. Both arguments have exactly the same form, that is, no, no A are B, some C are not B, therefore some A are not C. The argument form is in fact invalid, but in the, in the original study, more than 70% of participants endorsed it when the conclusion was believable compared with only 10% when it was not. They also found belief bias on valid arguments, although to a less extent. So, and now we have slide number five to make the comparison. This was originally described as conflict between logic and belief, which could be resolved in either direction. The finding of this early paper have been replicated many times and make a kind of paradigm case of dual processing. What is clear in this case is that people both endorse more syllogism which are valid than invalid, and also more whose conclusions are believable rather than unbelievable. This invites, the inference, uh, this invites the inference that there are two kinds of mental processes involved. Some kind of logical reasoning on the one hand and belief bias on the other, usually attributed respectively to type one and type two processes. One of the original explanations offered was that people have a strong tendency to accept believable conclusions intuitively, but scrutinize unbelievable conclusions more closely. A similar account was offered by mental model theorists. For this reason, unbelievable conclusions are subject to more type two reasoning. This would explain the interaction shown in slide five, where validity has much weaker effect with believable conclusions. This is an example of what is known now as default interventionist dual process theory. The general idea is that a fast heuristic, in this case believability, can precede and preempt type two reasoning by providing a default response. The, this default is maintained unless a slower type two process intervenes with analytic reasoning. However, recent evidence suggests that response latencies are not consistent with this account. A more recent view of the interaction is that there are two kinds of belief bias operating in the task. One, a pure response bias, type one, and the other a form of motivated reasoning type two, which in combination produce the main effect of belief and the interaction between belief and logic. There are a number of other recent papers on the belief bias effect, which I do not have time to discuss here. A big contemporary issues, 
is whether it is necessarily beliefs which provide default intuitions or whether these can be cued by logical form as well. Such findings have prompted criticism of default interventionist theories, and I am sure you will hear more about this from other speakers in this symposium. While subject to challenge from recent findings, the majority of dual process theories in the psychology of reasoning and decision making are currently of the default interventionist form. These include theories of Keith Stanovich, Danny uh, Kahneman, and myself. However, there is an alternative structure known as parallel competitive. In this form, the two processes operate in parallel with conflict resolution, if necessary, applied at the end. The best known theory of this type in cognitive psychology is that of Stephen Sloman. The received theory and the normative fallacy. As both Kate Stanovich and I have noted in various publications, there are a number of quite similar dual process theories to be found in the lit literature which propose a similar feature for type 1 and type 2 processes. Both he and I have published lists of these, some of which are shown, shown in slide 6. Okay. So you see type 1, unconscious, 2, conscious, automatic control, high capacity, low capacity, rapid and parallel, slow and sequential, cognitive biases, normative responding, pragmatic, belief-based, logical abstract, independence of working memory, and IQ related to working memory and IQ. Okay, these publications have had an unfortunate and unintended consequences as Stanovich and I now recognize. They have led to, to what we call a received dual view theory. I hope that uh, 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 Guillaume Bolac and I did not make that, uh, I would say, fallacy <laughs> in one of our papers. Okay. Okay, so this way a kind of received view on dual processes have been, has been established. Okay. okay. The received theory is what people mean when they refer to dual process theory without reference to any particular author or publication. It has somehow come to include all such features as are shown in this slide as necessary and defining characteristics of the two kinds of processes. And although this received theory is actually proposed by no individual authors, it has come to be used by friends and critics of dual process theory alike when debating evidence for and against accounts. In particular, evidence which contradicts this impossibly strong received theory is used by implication to criticize all individual published accounts using the dual process framework. A particularly insidious aspect of, these, of this received theory is what I call the normative fallacy. Normatively correct responding indicates the use of type 2 processing. Errors or cognitive biases indicates the use of type 1 processing. Okay, so let's see what Jonathan Evans thinks about this. Authors frequently write as though the received dual process theory equates type 1 processing with cognitive biases and type 2 processing with normative correctness. This is an example of what Stanovich and I call confusion of typical correlates of the two kinds of processing with defining features. It is true that in the literature on reasoning and decision making that cognitive biases have typically been attributed to heuristics of type or type 1 processing providing unreliable intuitions. This was a central feature of many of my own earlier accounts of biases. It is also true that normative accuracy has been used by some authors, especially Keith Stanovich, as a standard for the rational reasoning type 2 processing is required to achieve. For example, his research shows that normatively correct solutions are more often found in those of higher IQ 
who are attributed with greater powers of type two reasoning. So why is it a fallacy? First, normativity is a philosophical and not a psychological concept. There are disputes for a number of tasks in the literature concerning which is the correct normative solution to apply. However, it is an empirical fact that the standard normative solution to most of these tasks is more often found by people with higher cognitive ability. But that does not mean that any normative solution, however simple, requires difficult reflective reasoning to achieve of the kind that would tax working memory, type two. Consider the case of a modus ponens inference such as that that is on slide eight. If there is an A on the card and there is a three on the card, there is an A on the card, therefore there is a three on the card. Okay, almost all participants, regardless of cognitive ability, will agree that the conclusion follows. The inference is so natural that some authors have suggested that it is hardwired into the language module. In spite of this, it, that, that, that was the thesis of Vinod Gohl yesterday, for example. Okay, this inference is so natural that some others have suggested that it, had, it is hardwired into the language module. In spite of this, the fact that modus ponens provides a compelling intuitive response has been used to criticize the received default interventionist form of dual process theory. Such criticism implies that a process must be type two simply because it results in a normatively correct answer. This is a fallacy and it makes no psychological sense. Some authors also write as though the theory also requires all type one processing to be belief based, but this too is wrong. I have long identified other influences of type one processing, for example, in my account of matching bias. The other half of the fallacy is the belief that, that type one processing necessarily leads to error and bias. Of course, it does not. There are many studies showing that expert judgment often relies on fast intuitive processes. This happens when relevant experiential learning has taken place and that makes perfect psychological sense. The reason that type one processes is so often blamed for biases in mainstream literature on reasoning and decision making is due to the type of experimentation. Participants are typically presented with novel problems whose solutions cannot be provided by experiential learning. With such problems, reliance on intuition may well lead to error, as in the bat and ball problem discussed earlier. This is not a justification for a normative fallacy. Bias and normativity are common cor correlates of type one and type two processing in the literature that use these novel tasks, but even then the correlation is imperfect. You certainly cannot use the normativity of, the, of an answer as being diagnostic of the type of process employed. Defining features of dual processes. Okay. Stanovich and I recently discussed and responded to a number of criticisms of dual process theories. We identified a lot of these as revolving around the received theory and particularly the assumption that all typical correlates of the kind shown earlier are necessary and defining features of the theory. I have already shown for one example, norm, that is normative correctness, that this is a fallacy and the same applies to others. For example, type one processing is not necessarily belief biased and type two reasoning may well draw upon prior belief. What then are the necessary and defining features of type one and type two processes? In my own writing, I have emphasized that type two processing engages central working memory 
and linked it with my theory of hypothetical thinking, <coughs> which required mental simulations. Stanovich has focused on the correlation with IQ, and I emphasized that type two thinking arises on tasks that require what he calls cognitive decoupling, the, that is the ability to suspend actual belief in order to reason in a hypothetical manner. <clears throat> it is evident that our definitions are fully compatible. Working memory capacity is known to be highly correlated with IQ. So it makes sense that processing that requires working memory will give rise to the correlations with IQ that Stanovich observes. Also, my definition of hypothetical thinking and Stanovich's cognitive decoupling are broadly equivalent concepts. We also agree that type one processes are autonomous. They do not require controlled attention, which is another feature of working memory. But as stated earlier, there are many times of autonomous processes so that type one is really a broad category. Two or more minds. While some others use the terms system one and system two more or less simultaneous, synonymously with type one and type two processing, other dual system theories are forerunners of what I now call, call two minds theory. The aspect of the, these theories that is relevant is the notion that there are two distinct forms of processing in the human mind. One which evolved early and is animal-like, and the other of which evolved later and is distinctively human. In my own development of, the, of this theory, set out in detail in 2010, I distinguished between the old or intuitive mind and the new or reflective mind. In the process, an important divergence from earlier dual system theories emerge, reconciling some of the difficulties that the latter had caused me. I found it impossible to equate type one processing with the whole mind and type two with the new mind in the manner that earlier talk of system one and system two had suggested. As stated earlier, type one processing refers to a range of different autonomous processes. One type would be innate cognitive modules of kind famously proposed by Fodor. Those included in, say, the visual and motor systems must be relatively ancient and are clearly shared with other animals and so rightfully belong to the whole mind together with general associative and implicit learning systems. But it occurred to me that there is strong evidence for at least two cognitive modules, which are not only unique to human beings, but essential for the new mind to function. These are the modules for language and meta representation, without which higher order representations and hypothetical thinking would not be possible. So while the whole mind operates through type one processing of different kinds, the new mind must reflect a mixture of type one and type two processing. In fact, it operates primarily by type one processing, such as that involved in retrieving and representing the various kinds of explicit memories in working memory. Its distinctive nature, however, is it's, it's the ability to manipulate such representations through working memory and to facilitate thinking which is hypothetical going beyond what has been learned. I define type two processing as occupying working memory by the def this definition, system one or type, uh, system two, pardon, or type two processing cannot be uniquely human as was commonly claimed about 20 years ago. As the biologist Fred Totes has pointed out, higher order control cognition associated with working memory is a feature of higher animals, including rodents and reptiles. 
Let us call this the Control Attention System, or CAS. We can see that CAS evolved for the purpose of allowing higher animals to respond to novelty and unpredictability in their environments, so that when fixed instinctive behaviors failed, they could still survive. But CAS on its own does not make a new mind or fully featured type two thinking. My view is that the parallel development of language, me meta representation, and greatly enlarged frontal lobes in Homo and Homo sapiens sapiens permitted the unique development of the new mind in our species alone. Two minds theory proposes that the new mind replaced the old, but rather, the, pardon, the two mind theory proposes not that the two mind replaced the old, but rather that it was added to it, and the two coexist within one brain. The idea was well developed in Stanovich's remarkable book, The Robot's Rebellion, 2004. He pointed out that while the genes remain firmly in control of what I call the whole mind, the new has developed its own mo motives. We hired the robots built by the genes for their survival, which have rebelled against them. Essentially, the genes goofed by making us too smart, too capable of independent thought. We can, for example, enjoy sex without contraception thus frustrating the goals of the genes which supply this facility for pleasure. But much as we strive to achieve our own goals through the new mind, the genes continue to assert their, their through the hold, creating conflicts. Old mind learning mechanisms, for example, can create phobias which frustrate the goals of the new mind. For example, someone may, may desperately want to travel to visit their child who settled overseas, but cannot do so due to a fear of flying beyond their conscious control. Another may be unable to break a gambling habit, even though they know full well that it is wrecking their career and marriage. More recently, Stanovich proposed a tripartite theory which appears to allow for three minds, which the terms autonomous, algorithmic, and, uh, autonomous, algorithmic, and reflective. However, the distinction between the, two, the last two seems to be driven by the psychometric approach and this and is theory of rationality. The algorithmic mind provides computational machinery linked with working memory and general intelligence, which permits cognitive decoupling or hypothetical thinking. The reflective mind contains belief, desires, and dispositions for rational thinking, which are separately measurable from intelligence from a psychometric standpoint. From my point of view, these are two aspects of the new mind, whereas the autonomous mind is the whole mind, and I see no real conflict in our proposals. Stanovich also wants to draw a sharp distinction between intelligence, as measured by IQ tests, and rationality, as measured by disposition, which he regards as properties of the algorithmic, on the one end, and reflective mind, on the other end. One of his wider pur purposes is to argue that intelligent tests do not directly measure rationality, although they are quite highly correlated with it. So the whole mind rationality driven by the past, a combination of natural selection and adaptive behaviors and experiential learning in the individual, new mind rationality driven by the future, plans, intentions, and mental simulations of the consequences of action. It requires cognitive decoupling and hypothetical thinking. I have drawn a sharp distinction in my own writing between the new and old mind rationality. The simplest way to explain this is to say that the whole mind looks to the past and the new mind to the future. 
We are instrumentally rational if we achieve our goals. The genes provided animals with two broad mechanisms for this. Intuitive behaviors, which are innately programmed and fixed, and general learning, which allows the animal to adapt to the peculiarities of its environment. Both are driven by what worked in the past. Instincts evolved by natural selection over the history of the species, and learning reflects the past experiences of the individual in the human whole mind. Similarly, the past dominates. The rationality of the new mind, however, looks to the future. We form plans and intentions. We engage in hypothetical thinking and mental simulations to test out how the world might be if we perform one action rather than another. This is where the human ability to form and manipulate higher order representations comes into play. And of course, it would not be possible without the computational power of what Stanovich calls the algorithmic mind, enabled by extraordinary development of the frontal lobes in the human species. While two minds theory is a natural development of dual process thinking, it certainly was for me. It does, of course, involve very broad proposals about evolution, as well as neural and cognitive architecture. Not all psychologists, especially those with a strong experimental orientation, want to follow this path, and nor do they need to do so. While two minds theory provides a broader context within which to understand dual processing, psychologists continue to develop and test particular dual processing accounts of experimental tasks, raising many difficulties and new questions in the process. This type of work will be well represented in the contrib contribution of speakers in this meeting. So I want to applause with you, Jonathan Evans, for this wonderful paper.